This is a tutorial for running a power analysis on a generalized linear mix model and on a linear mix model uh, by simulating data from scratch. So this power analysis is based mostly on the question of how many items you need to capture an effect. Uh, it's a lot more complicated to simulate things in a data set like participant level random effects or item level random effects. Uh, so it's explained by this note in the script itself. Uh, this is to some extent a simplification of what the actual data would be like, but it's a good enough approach for determining whether or not you have enough items to capture your effect. So the first thing that you need to do is run these lines of code to install and load the packages you need. Then uh, we'll start first by running the generalized linear mixed model. Um, so in the design that we're looking at here, we have two different participant groups, heritage speakers and second language speakers. And each of those groups sees three levels of uh, manipulation. So either speaking with somebody of lower, same or higher status. So this is essentially a two by three design. So the first thing you have to uh, define in the code is the number of simulations that you'd run. Uh, what I recommend here is run a low number first so that you can be sure that you're happy with what the code does and what the results look like, and then run it with a higher number of simulations so you can be sure to get more stable results. Uh, on my computer, running with 100 stimulations can take up to an hour or so. Um, for now, though, I'll just run it with three simulations. So we define here the number of items um, within each condition. So for instance, this says that each participant would see five items for the lower status category, the same, higher, uh, same status category, and the higher status category. So you can change this number as needed to test different number of items. Then um, we, you, what we specify is for each group and for each level of the manipulated factor, you say the probability that the dependent variable will be one outcome versus the other one. So for instance, in this design, it's the participant's use of tú versus usted. So this is saying something like, for instance, heritage speakers would have a 20% chance of using usted with somebody of lower status, 50% chance with higher status, or same status, and 80% chance with higher status. So you can change these numbers um, to hypothesize different underlying uh, data. So for instance, notice how here we have sort of a main effect of status because higher status has a higher chance of usted. And then uh, there's also um, a main effect of group because all things being equal, heritage speakers have a higher chance of using usted than second language speakers. And finally, an interaction because the effect of status is larger for the heritage speakers than for the L2 speakers. But again, you'd want to change these based on the kind of data that you want to simulate. Oh, okay, so um, the way the code works is that we run a lot of iterations and then for each iteration we record the observed uh, p-values and then uh, we get the different powers for the different sample sizes. So all of these lines of code are doing are pre-allocating the lists with the p-values and power so you don't have to change anything here. And now this asks uh, what is the minimum and maximum number of participants to test? So for this example we test uh, if you have five participants um, in each of the HS or L2 groups, then if you have six participants, then seven participants, and so on, all the way to 50. So after you've defined all of these parameters above, then really you can run um, this next chunk of code without changing anything because it's all already um, set up. Um, but I'll just walk you through a little bit of how it works uh, inside it. So notice how this is running a loop that tests a given sample size in the range that you would define. So for instance, for my example, let's say we want to look at 10 participants in each of the groups. Okay. Uh, we have a lot of lines of code here that will build the data frame. Okay. And then let's see, I'm just going to randomly set I to one for the first simulation here. Okay, so I'm just breezing through the lines of code that generate an example data frame. Uh, in the annotation, you have some explanation of how this code works. Basically, here, we're generating random numbers between 0 and 1, 
And if they're above or below the threshold we had defined for each participant group, then we code them as zero or one corresponding to use of tu versus usted. And then uh, we have some more data wrangling where we generate labels and reformat the matrix as a data frame and put labels on them and so forth. So I'll skip ahead and show you what one uh, simulated data frame looks like. So here you can see we have, uh, for instance, 10 participants, participants 1 through 10 for the HS group. And then for the L2 group, we have participants number 11 through uh, 20. Okay. And then you can see their labels for if they're heritage speaker or L2, and the label for if it's a lower, same, or higher status speaker. And then our DV here is what's labeled score. So here we're saying, for example, zero can mean use of two, one can mean use of usted, or something like that. Or you can, in your head, kind of flip the values around as it's really arbitrary. Okay, so once we've generated one uh, data frame like that, then you actually run the model on it. So notice here, we're running a generalized linear mixed model, uh, where score is the DV, and then we have main effects of social status, and of HS or L2 group, as well as their interaction, and then we've also added here a random intercept per participant. So technically we didn't actually bake into the data any uh, participant level random effects because we treated each participant equal to any other participant within the groups. So for example, heritage speaker number one and heritage speaker number two are treated as if they have the same probability of using tu or usted but when you add this random intercept in the generalized linear mix model, then it's accounting for the fact that those two participants might have different baseline levels of tu or usted use. So um, for each iteration, when it runs the model, actually it'll say, um, we have a, well here it didn't actually say it, but if it were to say boundary singular fit, then the reason that it would pull up that warning is because the random intercept for participant wouldn't be justified. In each iteration, we would pull out the p-values and then add it to our list of p-values for that participant sample size. So what I'm going to do here is I'll run this internal for loop. Okay. So that you can see what it looks like. Where, for instance, um, here would be the list of p-values that we get for these iterations. Uh, notice that all of the effects are very, very significant, it would seem, for the effect of social status. And then this uh, loop is nested within a larger loop that tests different uh, numbers of participant sample sizes. So after it rinses and repeats that process for five participants and six participants and so on all the way to 50, what the code does is it gets the... Um, it tells you how many times the results came out as significant for each of the sample sizes so that what you come up with is a list of power values for each of the different sample sizes. Now I'm going, I was going there into the um, nuts and bolts of how the co code works under the hood um, but of course once you define the initial values you can just run this loop in one go and it'll test all of your sample sizes for you for the generalized linear mixed model. So here I hit control enter when the cursor is at the external for loop. Okay, uh, It'll take a little while and then once it runs all the simulations, you can give it a moment here, but once it runs all the simulations we'll be able to visualize uh, the power curves. As I mentioned before here it's running only three iterations uh, per sample size that we want to test. So it's going uh, faster than it would otherwise, but when you actually do this for real, you want to have maybe say a hundred simulations, which can take quite a long time. So you can start the code running and then go do something else and then go back and see your results. Okay, so I'll just give this a few seconds until the simulations are finished.
Okay, so once the simulations are done running, you can generate the power curves. So first, here we have the power curve for the first effect. So this is looking at the effect of uh, social status. So what this plot is showing you is for each uh, sample size that you've tested, what is the probability that your inferential test will come out significant for that effect? So in the simulated data, uh, actually every single one of the iterations came out significant. So this is saying 100% chance of finding the significant effect, even if you only have five participants per group. Okay. For the simulated data, also um, the effect of heritage speaker versus L2 group is, uh, shows very strong power. This is actually not very realistic. Uh, and here's the power curve for the interaction. Um, so the reason that this is kind of balancey like this is because we ran so few iterations uh, for the, just for this demonstration. Actually, the power curve that you get when you run the real number of simulations would be more smooth. But what you're seeing here is for each number of participants within the HS and L2 groups, what's the probability that you would pull out a significant effect? So for instance, this is saying, hmm, you need maybe around 50 participants or so to get 80% power for detecting the interaction. Okay, so now we can run everything again, but we're going to do it instead for the linear mix model, which as you'll recall, uses a continuous dependent variable instead of the categorical 0, 1 dependent variable. So this is going to follow the same general format as uh, before. First, we define the number of items that each participant sees per condition. So here we're testing five items. Now we're going to give the mean values for each of the conditions for each of the groups. So for instance, this is saying a mean Likert scale rating of 40 for heritage speakers with lower uh, status condition. 50 for the same status condition, 60 for the higher status condition, and then for the L2 speakers, those values are 40, 45, and 50. Unlike with the previous analysis, uh, for this one, we need to also define uh, variance. So for instance, here's the standard deviation uh, for each of those participants group pairs. Actually, uh, if I'm not mistaken, one of the assumptions for these inferential tests is that variances are equal across groups. So we just put in one variance for, uh, that applies to each of the groups and each of the conditions. Of course, here a higher number for the standard deviation means more noise in your data so that it's harder to pull out an effect. A lower number means less noise, making it easier to pull out an effect. So you can adjust this based on the kind of data that you want to simulate. Another sort of complication too is that because we're working with Likert scale ratings, technically you can't get a number that's below zero or in this case a number that's above 100. So what I've done here is whenever the data simulates a number that's negative or above 100, uh, I'm going to just replace it with either 0 or 100 correspondingly. So those are the floor and ceilings, um, the floors and ceilings for the data we're simulating. Uh, and then this parameter I've set to true if you want to implement this cutoff. If you want to use this code to look at dependent variables that don't have a floor and that don't have a ceiling, you can set it to false and then it won't uh, implement that operation in the code below. That's before uh, we pre-allocate a name of a list that keeps track of the observed p-values and powers. And here we're going to be testing again 5 to 50 participants. Okay. So this time I'm not going to actually run any uh, of the lines within this loop, but just to give you a brief flying overview, this is going to test for each of the values between 5 and 50, yeah, it'll generate a sample uh, data set. Okay. Um, so here, let's see, these lines here are where the actual numbers are being uh, generated. So this is generating a normal distribution with the number of items and number of participants you defined with the uh, means and standard deviations that you had defined uh, before, and it'll keep doing all of those uh, formatting steps up until you get um, one data frame that's ready to go. Okay, and then this is the step that implements the uh, floor and ceiling cutoffs. If you had uh, set that value to false before, then it's going to ignore this altogether. So after it generates one data frame, 
Uh, then here you can see how the actual model is being run. We have score as the dependent variable. And then social status and uh, HS or L2 group as main effects with an interaction between them. And we have a random uh, intercept here for uh, participants. After it runs that model, it'll pull out the p-values and it'll keep uh, track of those p-values for the number of iterations that you've defined. After it runs all those iterations, um, then it will calculate how many of them came out significant. And then it'll rerun everything but using a different sample size. So I'm going to go ahead and run all this. So we'll have to give it a minute while it runs the models itself. Of course, like I mentioned before, this is just three iterations for each of the sample sizes. So it's doing it very quickly. And like before, here we have our power curves. So for our simulated data, it's 100% power for the main effect of social status. For the effect of HS or L2 group, here you can see that to get 80% power, you'd want something like 26 uh, participants per group. And then here's the power curve for the interaction. So actually, uh, for the simulated data, you would need more than 50 participants to get 80% power. And the reason that this power curve is all jagged like this instead of smooth is because we ran uh, very few iterations, so the results aren't stable. Again, when you do this yourself for your actual data, you're going to want to run more iterations, uh, which will take longer for your computer to do. Okay, and then finally, for uh, this analysis with the continuous dependent variables, uh, we can actually also visualize what the underlying data look like. Um, so this uses the last parameters used in the uh, loop before with, uh, I believe, 50 participants uh, per group. But here you can see uh, these kernel density plots showing um, what the means and standard deviations are here, or you know the mean and the variance for each of the groups in each of the conditions. So this gives you kind of a visualization of the kind of data that you're uh, looking at. So um, this makes it a little bit more intuitive to see um, the kind of data that you're hypothesizing. And, of course, notice that technically this is not a normal distribution because we have these cutoffs at 0 and 100. But, um, like a lot of statisticians do, we just kind of ignore the fact that Likert scales don't go from negative infinity to uh, infinity. Okay, there it is.